Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Well, everybody, and welcome back. On today's episode, we are going to talk about why God created hell. Is there a contradiction between an all-loving God and the existence of hell? Oftentimes, you will hear people object along these lines. They will say, how could a God that is all-powerful and all-loving create such a place as hell? How is that How is that possible? Is there a contradiction there? Is there even a tension there? Now, my contention will be completely the opposite, is that hell is not a contradiction from an all-loving God. Hell is a necessary result of from an all-loving God. And what I would propose is that while there may seem to be a tension on the surface level, when you really start to understand the situation, you will see there is deep harmony and concord between an all-loving God and the existence of hell. And that's what we are going to explore on today's episode. So please stay tuned. Please join us. We will also be returning to the argument from contingency in the next day or so. I figured... We will give a slight break from all the heavy philosophizing and go a little bit more into theology and and how to defend specific doctrine. Uh, So, by the way, real quick, if if you've been enjoying this podcast, and I think we're on episode 9 or 10 now, which is great, the break point for most podcasts is around episode 7, where statistically, if you get past episode 7, you're good to go. Now, I had no concerns about that. I've been podcasting for years on various shows, so... I came in full well knowing what I was getting myself into, and we are in this for the long haul. So so all I would ask from all of you, if you are enjoying this podcast, is please consider subscribing on iTunes or Stitcher and leaving us a five-star review. I know it sounds a little cheeky asking for five-star reviews. Obviously, I only want you to give one if you think we deserve it, but those five-star reviews really do help bring new people to the show. So if you think what we're doing is important work, In terms of apologetics and evangelization, please help support our mission by leaving that five-star review on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you subscribe. Okay, now to the topic. God and the existence of hell. So how do we think about this? How do we start to reconcile what seems like a contradictory position? We have an all-loving, all-powerful, we have an all-loving, all-powerful God on one hand, and we have this place that most of us would call hell. On the other hand, well, there's a few things we have to do to really understand why hell exists and how it exists in relation to a God that that loves us and wants all of us to come into a free, save love relationship with himself. Now, the first thing to get clear on is just what exactly heaven and hell are to begin with. And we have to make sure that we have removed all caricatures or mischaracterizations, because sometimes when a lot of people talk about hell or heaven, what they're talking about is is really not heaven or hell at all, but like something they saw on a cartoon once. And I guess the simplest way to to explain it would be, I'll use the words of, um, of Balthazar, and he said that heaven simply is God gained, and hell simply is God lost. So heaven is a place where we are in eternal communion and friendship with God, where all of our human teleology and ends are perfectly met in the beatific vision. No one is left wanting. All our desires, our perfect happiness is complete. Hell, however, is eternal separation from God. It's choosing away from God. And it is a place of eternal suffering because we we then are in a position where what we are aimed at, what we are for, which is a loving, saving relationship with God, is lost. And nothing could be more painful than that. Nothing could, could be more devastating than that. So... You have to start to to think of it in in more related ways. You, you don't want to just think that like hell is a place where God um, actively dips people in a vat of boiling molten sulfur 
for 100 billion calendar years because he didn't like the way that they behave sexually. That's just – that's stupid. That's that's just dumb. That is not what hell is. God – this is a very important point. God does not send anybody to hell. God simply allows people to go to hell, and that is a, a crucial distinction. God wills. We know that God wills that all may be saved. God's desire is for all of us to come into a loving, saving relationship with him, for all of us to go to heaven. That's what God wants. Um, but but now here's, the, now here's the interesting thing. Here's what we have to start to think about. Does God always get what he wants? Does God always get what he wants? Well, it seems like if hell exists, then like if hell exists, then then no, God might not, might not, not saying that he doesn't, but God might not always get what he wants. Now, now, why is that? How? Because I thought with God, all things were possible. That for God, you know, no thing is impossible. And guess what? That's true. That's true. But God can't create nonsense. God can't do what is logically impossible because that is not a thing at all. Now, what am I getting at? What am I talking about here? Well, think of it like this. If God knew that he ha- he wanted to create free creatures, now, why would he want to create free creatures? Why would he want to create humans with free will? Well, if if we do you know, believe that love is the highest possible good, especially a love-save relationship with God, it seems like love is really only something that could, could be valid, is only something that could be real if it was freely chosen, okay? Love has to, has to be something that we ourselves choose to do. It's a, it, it is, it, freedom is a necessary condition for love to attain, for love to exist, now, here's the thing with that. If God wanted us to be free so that way we could come to know and love him and also experience moral development, that's a huge part of it too. Part of our freedom is that God knew that moral development uh, was a really high good, one of the highest possible goods. But for us to even experience moral development, for us to experience love, we have to be free. We have to have the ability to choose and not only just choose, but for our choices to have actual significant consequences. Sure, God could have given us free will, but then limited our choices to either seeing the numeral seven or seeing the color green. And that's the only two choices we could ever make for all eternity is we could see the numeral seven just written <laughs> or we could see the color green and we could have the freedom to kind of choose back and forth of which one we want to look at for all time. so yeah like okay we'd be we'd be free but that doesn't seem like those are sufficient conditions for the type of freedom that that we that god wants us to have to experience moral development and love to experience moral development to shape ourselves into the, the types of people that other people will want to spend time around with in heaven, <laughs> morally uh, good people, virtuous people, people will people who will actually uh, experience heaven as the greatest conceivable joy because of the type of character they have shaped themselves to be. For that to happen, we not only have to have free will, but we have to have a set of circumstances where the choices we make are going to be significant. Okay, this is where it gets a little bit more sophisticated, but it's going to help us really to understand. Now, if God made us free and 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 genuinely free, then God might not get everything that he wants because you can't force a free creature to act a certain way. That is a logical contradiction. As soon as you start, there's no such thing as a forced freedom, right? It's like saying that there's uh, such a thing as a married bachelor. It's just it, It's just a meaningless assembly of words. So if God made us free, there's a certain risk involved, and that risk is we might choose against God, or we might choose to do the wrong things. So here is here is a, a very interesting thing to think about, that, that God might not, might, I, say, I keep saying might because it's not absolutely certain, but God might not be able to get everything he wants. If he wants us to come into a loving, saving relationship with himself, he not only had to give us freedom, but he had to respect that freedom and create a set of circumstances that would be maxly conducive to fostering that relationship and moral development. Now, within those circumstances, it might not be possible to foster that relationship with everybody. Uh, it cannot be, freedom is not something that, that can be forced. And for freedom to be genuine and real, 
people have to have the ability to choose otherwise. If they couldn't have chosen otherwise, then, then that freedom really doesn't account for much or to choose poorly. So once you understand freedom of the will, a lot of things start to make sense. One is that in order for freedom to attain and be meaningful, not only do our choices have to be significant, but freedom has to be played out in an environment that is itself not free, but determined. If I could just manipulate the laws of nature or physics uh, at any time that I wanted, I could always reverse any of the potential consequences from my decisions, which would undermine moral development, which would, which would make freedom pretty much pointless. So freedom has to be played out in a stage that is more or less rigid and stable, that operates according to regularities and so on and so forth. Think of a kind of a, a chess match, right? The only way that chess can be played is that there's certain rules that people are abiding by. Now, every once in a while, you might make an exception here or there and allow a person an extra move or something like that. But if every person could change the rules on the fly, nobody could play a game of chess or even checkers. Well, same thing. If, if part of our love relationship involves meeting other souls and part of moral development involves interacting with other people, we need that we need a something like a chessboard. We need a stage that follows certain regularities so we can interact uh, with other people in a free and meaningful way. And sure, occasionally certain miracles can happen, but they're the they're the, they're the great exception, not the rule. Now with this there comes even further risk. So with freedom comes the risk of choosing poorly, right? But in order for freedom to to really be significant, it has to be played out on a stage that operates according to certain regularities. Now, that sets up the potential for other risks, such as that the fire that can warm you is also the fire that could burn you if you don't, you know, uh, think about things properly or you wind up in the wrong place at the wrong time. Same thing. The water that quenches your thirst could also be the water that drowns you. So not only do we have now uh, a world that is that makes possible moral evil, but also natural suffering as well. And all of this comes down to trying to understand what is God actually wanting? What is God's actual mission? God's mission was not to create a world full of fat, contented marionettes. God did not want humans to just be his happy puppets where he just pulls all the strings. God wanted us to enter into a free, loving, saving relationship with him. Now, for that to even be possible, the stakes have to be high to be high and real. And people so often make the mistake of, uh, of and become skeptical because they, they, they start from a deeply flawed theological premise. They think that if they were God, then they would have just, you know, uh, you know, the, the, they wouldn't have a world where uh, there's any natural suffering or where animals eat other animals or things like that. But that's, that's not, First off, you're not God. So any type of argument where you're trying to assume the mind of God is always going to be extremely chancy and dubious. It's never going to be sust be sustainable because we're not omniscient. We don't see the full, complete picture like God does. But it's also wrongly assuming the intentions of God. It's often like people thinking, well, if I, if I was God, I would have designed humans this way. Well, first off, that's silly because you know, nobody is, is starting, no serious religious person is starting from the premise that, you know, God's objective in life was to impress humans with his uncanny engineering ability. Uh, yet so many people, especially atheists, seem to take that line of reasoning. Well, if I was God, I would have designed humans uh, with their testicles inside their stomach. Well, <laughs> okay, okay, friend. That's nice, but uh, again, uh, God wasn't trying to, you know, win us over by showing us how great of a technical engineer he was. Um, certainly, I think God has still done that when we look at the world and how just beguiling and amazing it is. Uh, clearly, there's a, an amazing super intellect behind it. But, but again, that isn't God's objective. God's objective is to give us freedom to come into a loving, saving knowledgeable relationship with himself and to experience moral development and all design can only be evaluated in light of what it is designed for so speculation about what you would do if you were god is 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 just a really poor if you're a skeptic let me help you out here stop stop 
advancing these lines of arguments. They're, they're about as bad as it as it possibly can get. Uh, Charles Darwin, Darwin also fall prey to this line of argument because part of his his reasoning, one line of his reasoning, I don't want to say it was all of it, was that you know he couldn't believe that the world was designed because you know lions kill other animals and that seemed cruel to him. Therefore, the world isn't designed, and that is about as egregious as a non sequitur as it as you could find, friends. That's like a, a textbook level example of a non sequitur. Because what's really happening here is he start he's starting from a theological confusion, and then trying to draw a scientific conclusion, and that itself is wholly uh, unacceptable. You don't you don't start from theological points and then draw scientific points. At least not typically. That's probably not going to fly over in the scientific community very well. But it's also a theological confusion because he thinks that again that God's purpose, whatever, was just to create a world of of perfectly contented, happy marionettes. No, God had much more exquisite and important plans than that. And than that. And going back to the original point, if our if God wanted us to be free so that we may attain that that genuinely freely chosen love save relationship with himself and experience moral development, then there is nothing about this world that seems incompatible with that. Now, we could, again, try and speculate of how things might have been different or better or worse, but again, we are not omniscient. We cannot make arguments from omniscient because we're not seeing the full, complete picture. We're just seeing one tiny little thread of this most exquisite Mona Lisa that is the history of the universe. And we just we just don't have all the pertinent, pertinent knowledge to make such speculations. But we can say that there's certainly nothing incompatible about uh, suffering, evil, or any of that. Um with what God's actual mission is for us. In fact, it seems like much of that would be necessary. In order to develop certain moral character traits and qualities, like justice, it seems like, or compassion, it seems like something like suffering is, is necessary, or inequality would be necessary for us to develop compassion. And justice and compassion are supremely good things. So it seems like the stage is actually pretty well set knowing what God really wants us to do, which again is develop morally and come to know and love him. But with that comes real risk. It comes risk of moral and natural evil and suffering. Um, now, getting back to the, t t t once you start to understand free will, this, and I promise all this does tie in, it also very much helps to explain the existence of hell. Because we said for freedom to be significant, there has there must be alternatives, and there must be a stage where the consequences of the choices we make are significant. Now, if God wanted us to be free, and he wanted love to be to be actual love and real and genuine, then he must respect our freedom. For if God our freedom, for if God could redact our freedom at any point, then that isn't really freedom at all. That's just kind of putting us on a long metaphysical leash. Now, what are we getting at? Well, if God wanted our ends to be genuine, if he wanted to create a world where we could come into a, a real loving, saving relationship with God and each other, um, then we have to be, then there has to be the option to choose not God, to choose away from God. And once you get that, once you understand that, that is the existence of hell, is for, for to respect human freedom, there must be an alternative. Now, God can only give what God can give, and the greatest thing that God can give, of course, is the gift of himself. It's in God that all of our uh, desires are ultimately fulfilled. It's that beatific vision that will complete our perfect happiness. <laughs> But, but, and, and that's all, that's all that God can give. God can't give what he, he doesn't have. Now he has everything in himself. So by giving himself, he is, he is giving everything. He is giving absolutely everything. And he gives himself uh, and wants us to love him. Not because he needs it. God doesn't need us to love him. He's not made any more perfect by our love for him, but because we need it. That's what completes and perfects us. And it's because God loves us that he wants us to love him. It's not like some needy, weird thing, egotistical thing like that. No, it's because God loves us. That's that's the way to understand it. That's the secret. But God can't force us to love him. God can't force us into heaven because that's not freedom. That's not genuine freedom. And the God that would force us into a relationship with him is a God that loves and respects his creatures that are free, but a coercive brute. The God that forces us into heaven is is not the God that created hell, but a God of hell. 
That that is the right way to think about it. And the God that created hell is a God that that so loves us and so respects us that he allows us, if we so choose, poorly to choose against him. And this is why it's so important to understand that God does not send anybody to hell. He simply allows it if we choose it ourselves. And this is why as Catholics we say that the gates of hell are locked from the inside. God wills that everybody be saved, that everybody come into a loving and saving relationship with himself. But because God loves us and because he made us free, he cannot force that onto anybody. And he, and he has to respect whatever our decision ultimately is. So that is a brief overview of, of why the existence of hell is not only not incompatible with all loving God, but necessary. Now, of course, there is the question of whether or not anybody actually winds up in hell, but that's a different question. Um, and it's a question that we will explore in future episodes of this of this podcast. And of course, like what is necessary uh, for eternal salvation? But but in this episode, all I wanted to do was touch on why the existence of hell itself, whether or not anybody actually winds up there, um, is not a contradiction with an all loving God, but is perfectly compatible and makes perfect sense when we understand human freedom and what God intends for us. Um, and what God's actual objective is in this world. So I hope this was helpful for you. I hope it helps to clarify a few points, and I hope it helps to equip you to respond to what is a very, very common but misguided objection um, with respect to our all-loving God. Um, if this was helpful, then please do share it, pass it along, and subscribe to the show. And again, uh, if you could Take two minutes to leave a five-star review on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play. That would be enormously helpful. Couldn't thank you enough for that. We've got tons of great stuff coming, lots of awesome guest interviews. Be sure to get caught up on the previous episodes. We will continue the argument uh, from Contingency for God's Existence here probably tomorrow. And until then, my friends, God love you. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.